Another aspect that is often used frequently in hypothesis testing is the presence of p-values. So here let's talk about what exactly p-values are, when they're used, how they can be used, what they represent, and then work them into our, our hypothesis testing procedure. So let's jump over and let's take a look at p-values and the idea behind them. So, okay, with our p-values, uh, our p-value is essentially what it's getting at is it's saying what is the probability probability we witnessed the result we did or more extreme if the null is true. So that is, we pull out some sample mean and we figure out, hey, what's the probability of witnessing this sample mean or more extreme under the assumption that the null is true? So let's, let's take a look at an example of this. Let's suppose that we have a distribution, we can appeal to the central limit theorem, x bar, there we go, centered around our mean. And let's say, let's say that this is a mean of 10. And let's say that we have a standard deviation of x bar equal to, uh, let's say 25 all over root 25. So that is, we had a sample size of 10. We had a standard deviation of x. Uh, sorry, we had a sample size of 10. What am I doing? Uh, we had a sample size of 25. And we had a standard deviation of x of 25. One and the same in this case here. Let's suppose that we go through and we want to go do a one-tailed test. So we're saying, hey, let's go through all of our steps. No alternative. And we're saying, okay, we're testing about mu. And we want to say, hey, is mu greater than 10 versus our null that in fact it is less than or equal to? Okay. Step two. Step two, let's say that we're going to test this at the, let's change it up. We did 5% in our last video. Let's go and say we're testing at the 10% level in this case. And of course, okay, we know what sigma is. We're doing x bar. This guy is mu. Mu. So step three, we're doing a z equals x bar minus mu all over sigma x root n. Okay, step four, our decision rule. What's going on with our decision rule? Okay, we want a 10% significance level. So 10% significance level, which tail are we looking at? Well, we're saying, hey, mu is greater than 10, so somewhere over here, such that I'm putting alpha in that tail. So that's 10%. Well, if that's 10%, all of that guy there, that's 40%. So if I were to standardize that, standardize that to a Z, right? Why, why a Z? Because I stated here, Z, why is it a Z? Because I know the population standard deviation. So what I'm gonna to wanna to do is I wanna find out what is my Z critical value here? And that is that Z critical value that corresponds with that cutoff between my rejection zone and my fail to reject zone. So again, how we would do that, we would go to our Z table and we would find in the middle, the Z statistic that corresponds with a 40% probability, or at least the closest one there too. So as we go do that, we end up with closest one, 0.3997. So that would be a Z statistic of 1.28. So, okay, we'd explicitly state that. We would say if Z is greater than 1.28, we will reject our null. Otherwise, we will fail to reject. That is essentially if we get some Z value in this zone here that's bigger than 1.28, that is similarly in our rejection zone. Okay, let's suppose we now conduct our sample. 
right? We conduct our sample of size 25, and we work out from this some value of x bar, and this value of x bar is going to be, let's say, I don't know, let's say 15. We get an x bar of 15. So, okay, step five, we're gonna figure this out. We're gonna say, what is the corresponding z value for that? Z is 15 minus 10 all over my standard errors. So that is 25 all over root 25. So I'm gonna have five all over 25 divided by root 25, that's gonna be five. So I get one as my z statistic. So, okay, where does that guy fall? Ah, that's gonna be one. There's my critical value, 1.28. So I'm gonna be somewhere around here. One. So, okay, that's not in my rejection region. So I could say, therefore, fail to reject. But I might still be interested to know, okay, although I'm failing to reject, well, what is the probability that I witnessed that, right? What is the probability that I witnessed one or more extreme? And so my p-value in this case here would be the probability that I witnessed one or more extreme. That is, it would be calculating this entire yellow area. That would be my p-value. So I can work that out, right? I can go to my Z table now and I can look up one. And if I look up 1.00, I get a probability, we'll bring it out that way. Uh, 1.00 has a probability of 3413. So, okay, that is not the probability I'm looking for. I'm looking for to the right. So I would go 0 0.5, 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5. Three, four, one, three, and I would get a p-value, probability of witnessing this value that I'd witnessed or more extreme, I would get 0 0.1587. That is a 15.87% chance of witnessing a value of x bar of 15 under the assumption that my true population parameter is actually 10. So, 15, almost a 16% chance that I witnessed this value of x bar or more extreme under the assumption that my null is true. So yeah, it's not, it's not super likely. Right in the same way we could do this in right, a bit of a different way to try and kind of challenge, I rejected my null, but how much evidence did I have? Let's take a look at that. Let's back up and let's rework this guy here. Okay, so in this case here, let's suppose that I pull out a value of x bar of 22.5. So, okay, let's work through this. What do I have? Again, I'm just going to pull down step three, and we're going to work through that. So, okay, that's going to be z equals 22.5 minus 10 all over my standard errors, so 25 all over root 25. That's gonna give me 12.5 over five. 12.5 over five gives me 2.50. So, okay, where does 2.50 fall? 2.50, that falls somewhere over there. Hey, that there is clearly in my rejection zone. So therefore, this case here, I'd say therefore, we would reject our null, right? Therefore, in this case here, if we pulled out a sample mean of 22.5, we would say that's pretty strong evidence. Well, maybe it's not super strong, but it's evidence against our null. We would take that as evidence to reject that the true population mean is in fact 10. But same kind of situation. Sure, we're rejecting, but how strong of evidence is this? Is this really unlikely to have been witnessed such that we take this as a lot of evidence against the null? Or is this just rejecting? Do we just hit that rejection threshold? Well, again, we can figure that out with the p-value. We can figure out with the p-value what the probability of witnessing that guy or more extreme was. 
So again, we'd be looking for this yellow area here that is witnessing 2.5 or more extreme. And the way we can do that is we can now take this 2.5 back and we can look up what is our probability of witnessing 2.5. So we go to our Z table, we look up 2.50. 2.50 yields for us a probability of 0 0.4938. Keep in mind that was this probability here, that is we witnessed between the mean and 22.5. Not what we're looking for, we're looking for the yellow one. So to get the yellow one, we would have to do 0.5 minus 0.4938, and that yields for us a p-value of 0.0062. That is less than a 1% chance of witnessing this sample mean if our true population mean is in fact true, right? If our null is in fact true, would be a better way to state that. Less than a 1% chance that we pull out this sample or more extreme if our null was in fact true. So, okay, in that case there, that's pretty unlikely. This isn't just a, oh, we just rejected our null. This is us, we significantly rejected our null. It's very unlikely we witnessed this result here. So our p-value is just more or less telling us what is our strength of evidence. The smaller the p-value, the stronger evidence against our null we have. The bigger the p-value, the weaker the evidence against our null we have. What we can also do, and it doesn't really do much good for our Zs because our Zs are all standardized. 1.28 is always for that 10% on and on and on, but it helps with our T statistics where we have a different T critical value depending on the degrees of freedom. What we can also do is we can express our formulate our rejection rule in terms of a p-value. And what that is, is we can say, let's just drop this down to make some room. We could, we could state this rejection rule as instead of, hey, if Z is greater than 1.28, I could state if I get a p-value less than my significance level, reject the null. So that is if I get a p-value less than my significance level, so if I get a p-value less than 10%, that would be a rejection of my null. So in our first case that we worked through, we got a p-value of 15%. Well, hey, that didn't reject the null. And that also didn't reject the null in our Z case there, right? These two will always agree with each other. In our second case, we got a Z of 2.5. Yep, that rejected. And we got a p-value of 0062. Yeah, okay, that rejected as well. So again, rejecting our null. Both of these guys agree with each other always going to be the case, right? They're always going to be that they agree with one another. So big thing there, we can work out a p-value. These become very, very useful because often when you're reading through reports, they will say, okay, no, 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 we got some average of 22.5 and then they'll say p-value of 0 0.0062. And then on and on and on, they'll keep talking about it. What this means is that essentially, hey, we got this value of a mean. This is the p-value attached to it. That is, because this p-value is so small, we take this as evidence against that null. Often in a lot of the reports, what they're testing against is a null of, hey, is our mean zero? That is, there's no effect, right? So. In that case there, if we were testing against a mean of zero and we pulled out an X bar of 22.5, it's saying, hey, yeah, no, there was an effect. This is significantly different than zero. That's essentially how you would read that. And that is the strength of evidence. The strength of evidence. The smaller the p-value, the stronger our strength of evidence. Let's take a look at one more example of this. Let's take a look at one more example. Let's just rework this. And in reworking this, we'll get a little bit of a different result. So let's just clean up and then take a look at it. So in this case, let's suppose we'll use the same numbers. 
we'll presume that in this case here, we'll have our null, we'll have our alternative. And in this case, we're just gonna do a two-tailed. So we're gonna say, hey, I'm not sure if my true population mean is 10. So hey, mu is not equal to 10 versus mu is equal to 10. Again, let's test this at the 10% level. And again, given everything we have, we'll presume this is a Z. So X bar minus mu all over population standard deviation root n. In this case here, we will have our value of X bar null is 10. Standard deviation of X bar, that was 25 all over root 25. We already worked that guy out to be five, so let's just write that guy down. And in this case, we want a alpha of 10%. So, okay, we're gonna go 10%, two-tailed, right? We don't have a statement of direction. We're just saying not equal to. So in that case there, we're gonna have 5% in this tail, 5% in this tail, 0 0.05, 0.05, and in that case there, that would be 45, 45 in the middle of each. We need to find our Z critical values in order to be able to formulate our decision rule. And again, the way we would do that is we would go to our table and we would find the Z value that's attached to, or at least the closest to, a probability of 45%. So going and doing that, this is where we're that perfectly split. This is our plus 1.645, and then on the other side there, negative 1.645. So there we go, we have our Z critical value. We can state if, I'm just gonna say it this way, if the absolute value of my Z, my test statistic that I calculate, and magnitude is greater than my critical value of 1.645, then I will reject my null. I can also state it a bit differently with my p-value. I can say, hey, if I get some p-value, which is less than my significance level, so less than 10%, I will similarly reject my null. And I can work through that. So let's go and work through that. Let's say that we have a value of X bar equal to 17.5. Okay, so we have a value of X bar equal to 17.5. So we wanna figure out, okay, 17.5, is this reject? Is this fail to reject? Where am I in this whole ordeal? Well, okay, what we do, we pull forward our step three and we work through it. So Z equals 17.5 minus my null, my assumed population mean of 10, all over my standard error. So 25 root 25. That gives me 7.5 all over five or 1.50. So okay, 1.50, that's not greater than this. I get, let's just draw that in here somewhere like so. Oh, let's try to make that a straight line. Something like so, 1.50. So in this case here, therefore, fail to reject. Okay, great, easy enough. But let's suppose we also wanna figure out the corresponding p-value with this. Right, so in this case here, to work out the p-value, we want probability that we witnessed 1.5 or more extreme. And so we'd be working out in this case here, this green area to get our p-value. So again, we'd go to our table and we'd start off by finding between 1.50 and the mean there. So 1.50 and the mean, that would be 0. Uh, 4332. So 1.50 or more extreme, that's 0 0.5 minus 0 0.4332. That gives me 0 
That is our probability of witnessing 1.5 or more extreme is 6.68%. And here you're looking at this and you're scratching your head. You're a little bit confused. You're saying, wait, wait, Keith, you said that, hey, these two would always have to agree. 1.5 would be a fail to reject, but hey, isn't this our p-value? A p-value of 6% is less than 10%. Shouldn't we be rejecting? Ooh, this is problematic, right? This is problematic. But, okay, let's keep in mind what's happening here. Because we're dealing with a two-tailed test, what we've just done is we've compared this 6.68% just to this 5%. So if we want to compare this to our actual significance level, what we need to do in this case here is we need to go two times to get our true p-value. That is, I shouldn't say two times the p-value, but rather two times 0 0.0668 would be my p-value. So in that case there, Two times that, I would get 0 0.1336 as my p-value. So 13.36% is my p-value in that case. And yes, 13.36, that is bigger than my significance level. So hey, again, therefore, fail to reject. So it does hold. We just got to remember two-tailed test times by two. That's our big takeaway there. So in future videos, we'll be taking a look at this again. We'll have a bunch of examples for hypothesis testing, working through all five steps. Some will say, hey, work out what it is based off the critical value. Some will explicitly ask for the p-value. Keep in mind that if we're asking for the p-value, sure, with a Z case like we've looked at here, you can work this out with the table. If we have a T distribution, that is if the standard deviation of X is unknown, if this is in fact S of X, well then this guy needs to be a T N minus one. If we have a T distribution, you cannot work out the P values using the table. You have to use a stats program such as Excel or R in order to work out those P values. And to work those out, it'd be exactly like how we'd work them out in previous cases. We didn't call them p-values back then, but exactly how we'd work out those corresponding areas underneath the curve. So if we're doing it for a Z, for a standard normal, yeah, we can do that using a table or using a stat software. Either will get you the same results. If you have a t-distribution and we're asking for a p-value, you need to use a stat software in order to get it. If you have any questions, Again, take a look at the upcoming examples. If they still remain, feel free to reach out to me either through the D2L Frequently Asked Questions or through email. Thanks.